you will, turn back in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. If you will. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow me in your outline. There is a outline and commentary in your bulletin. As we look at the third application of John 10, we have one more second, rather. We have one more after this one. We will be preparing for the Lord's table, as Elder said, for next week. Let us uh, be thoughtful and mindful of the importance of our thoughts and our hearts being right for that precious event. John chapter 10 is where we are today for our second observation. And in preparation for that, I was thinking this morning, I had the pleasure of running into our brother Danny Ramirez's mother. If you guys remember Danny, we put him away just a short while ago. And his mother, whom Danny used to talk about affectionately, um, she was the joy of his heart. Um, she's standing outside. She's one of our older sisters, you know. And you know how I love to talk about being old, right? Uh, she's standing outside, and she's just looking just as young as can be, 84 years old, standing outside. And she said, you don't remember me, do you? And I uh, said, of course I remember you. I didn't remember her at all. <laughs> I, I remember her face, right? I remember her face, right? But in my mind, I had her kind of sitting down, kind of tired, kind of geriatric, you know. <laughs> and she just energetic as can be standing up there. So this was this kind of acronistic experience I had where this is Danny's mother, but she does not look like Danny's mother which means God has been good to her. Are you in the house? Are you? Raise your hand if you're in the house. Raise your hand. God has been so good to her. We're glad to have you in the house with us. Yeah. Just want you to know. Um, and I was just thinking because since the time that we put Danny away, we have also, fortunately, because they were believers, also put other believers away up to this time too. This year we have seen a lot of the saints graduating, haven't we? And... Uh, and I was thinking, how should I feel about that? Because me and Danny used to debate how old we were, you know. And Danny always won. He was older than me by one year. Always. He always won. Every year, he's always one year older than me. And uh, <laughs> so today is Danny's birthday. And, and I, was, I was still arguing with mom about who's the oldest. And she told me, no, Danny would have been older than you. So, uh. Danny's, Danny's older than me. We'll be the same age in glory. Uh, we'll be the same age in glory. And I was thinking as I was preparing the message today about the joy that a believer should have and not the sorrow of the passing of other believers. And then also the, um, the kind of coveting for that place that Danny is in versus where we are. This is not a bad place where we are as a believer, um, but it's not the best place. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and to be with Christ is far better. But God leaves us here because it's needful. The reason why you and I haven't checked out yet is because it's needful for us to be here. So let us understand that and thank God for the moment, but never view departing from this life as something lesser. When you leave, if you are truly a child of God, what you have come in, is enormous enormous and with that then I want to begin to work your thoughts on something uh, suppose all of your Christian life you had a walk with God by faith that constituted trembling y'all know what I'm talking about kind of a trembling walk we have with God as you serve God because Faith is humbling. Faith is not something that makes you proud and arrogant and boastful. When we walk by faith, it means we are walking humbly with the Lord our God, right? Faith is a humbling thing because you got to trust God. you got to trust God, and that's not easy. But do you recall those times where you were walking with God, and, and more times than not, you can count the revelations of his glory that came to you through what Solomon calls in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9, the lattice, the Venetian blinds, where the windows are open just a little bit and you can see through the slats out. And the bride of Solomon, which is, which is a type of the church, and Solomon, a type of Christ, talked about how Solomon would visit her house and be on the outside of the house 
making noise to let her know he was near. And she would look through the slats and she could see the silhouette of her lover, the beloved, the one she said is my beloved. And child of God, don't we know those occasions where God shows up in our life where we can see through the slits and realize that he's near and our hearts start beating faster if you really do love him? Because biblical faith works by what? Love. And so when Christ draws nearer to us, our hearts pant with adoration and longing and desire to see more of him. Now this occurs on those special occasions when God allows you, if you remember, I know there are not many like this, where God allows you to read your Bible. And in reading your Bible, you have these especially anointed times. You know what I'm talking about? Where the thought of the text blows up and becomes so large that you're fixed on it. Your mind is locked in. Your, your heart is locked in. Your affections are drawn into that text. And you are compelled to stay there and just ruminate on the glory of that proposition or that promise or that, that truth that's coming to you. You can't let it go. You know at those times that God is talking to you. We, 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 we call those real devotional periods. The other stuff where you read like, you know, speed reading, that ain't devotion. That's just going through the form of reading. Devotion is when your heart is in it. When God meets you in his word and your heart is in it. And your soul says, Lord, I want to stay right here. Now, now you know you got to go to work, right? But your soul says, I want to stay right here because you know that the shepherd of your soul has come near to confirm you as his sheep. And thus we love the word of God, don't we? We love the word of God because through it, the shepherd speaks. However, most of the time, be honest with me, most of the time you and I are kind of just walking in the darkness of faith. You got that? We are walking in the darkness of faith, holding the hand of the shepherd as he leads us through this crazy world right? Committed to hope, and hope is always that which you do not see. Committed to hope, right? Trusting that he will get us to point A, from point A to point B safely. Is that the normative walk of the believer? The believer is walking in the darkness of faith. Faith is the substance of things what? Hope for the evidence of things what? Not seen. So we don't walk by sight. We walk by what? Right, and as such, we are trusting the Savior in spite of our circumstances. Now, that's the walk of a sheep with his shepherd, where the shepherd has laid out promise upon promise to the sheep that he will get you to the fold. Didn't we learn last week that sheep do three things, right? They follow, they feed, and they what? Fold. They follow, they feed, and they fold. That's all we do. That's why we don't watch sheep movies, because it's boring, right? All they do is follow feed and fold. Follow, feed, and fold. And if you're Christ, you're called to do what? Follow him. And if you're Christ, you're called to follow him to the green pastures where he feeds your soul and strengthens and nurtures you and enters into a relationship with you. And then after feeding you, he calls you to continue to follow him. We get a chance to rest. That's what the fold means. Didn't we learn that last week? You guys remember that typo in our outline where I had the word dressed, D-R-E-S-T? When my boy came through, my boy came through. Y'all ask him which boy it is, I'm not going to tell you, but my boy came through. He texted me, he said, Pastor, that's a good word. D-R-E-S-T is an old archaic word for what is now called D-R-E-S-S-E-D. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're called to follow him into the fold and rest, we're also called to follow him into the fold and get dressed, D-R-E-S-T. Um, I just wanted to let you know sometimes your mistakes are not mistakes at all. It's just people are too ignorant to know it's not a mistake. But what truly is the assurance of salvation for the believer? What constitutes the assurance of our salvation as a believer? If in fact we are walking by faith in the darkness of hope and the expectation of hope, 
The assurance of the believer is what Christ has done for us, what Christ is doing for us, and what Christ will do for us. Listen to these words in verse 27 and 28 as we begin to lay down a characteristic of his role as shepherd. And I want you to really grasp this today. The Lord Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. It does not say, and they know him. Even though that's true too. It's more important that he knows us than that we know him. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them what? Eternal life. And they shall never what? Perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I want you to grasp right here in verses 27 and 28 the security and assurance of the believer in Christ. Verse 27 and 28 describes what we call the security of our salvation and the assurance of our salvation. And here's how I want you to understand this. The security of God's people does not lie in who they are or what they do, but rather the security of God's people lies in who he is, what he did, and their assurance lies in what he has said he has done he is doing and he will do please get this you and i are not to find our assurance in what we do we are to find our assurance in what he did for while you are seeking to find assurance in what you do you are carving out your own works righteousness which might well deceive you in this life, making you think you're all right with God. But on that day when you stand before him, he might very well say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I want to press this home. The, the security of the believer and the assurance of the believer is completely rooted in their confidence in their shepherd. Do y'all hear what I just said? It is for this reason you want to know Jesus. You want to know the Father. You want to know the Son. You want to know the Holy Ghost because this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Have you guys got my opening emphasis? That the security of the believer is predicated upon and based upon who Christ is and what he has said. The assurance of our soul lies in this fact that he has told us that he has given us eternal life and that we will never what? Perish. What awesome words from the mouth of the shepherd of the sheep. Now, pastor, why is it that the Lord Jesus standing in the front of these thousands of people and more particularly the rulers of the church, which we have already identified are called false shepherds, right? of whom God had already declared both in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel that he would take his sheep out of their hands because they scattered them abroad upon the mountains and they fed themselves and not the sheep. You guys remember that? Christ here in the person of the Father and by the power of the Spirit is snatching sheep out of their hand and bringing them to himself right as we speak. And what is he doing for their soul? Comforting them with words that only he could give to them. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. You know what the blind man said? Amen. You know what the disciple said? Amen. You know what the woman caught her in adultery said? Amen. You know what the lame man that was at the, at, at the waters by Bethesda said? Amen. And all those whom Jesus had touched and called could say amen. Because they are gathered together under the Lord's shepherd and they know how blessed they are to know Jesus as their savior. And our Lord Jesus is uttering words to the larger audience, but they are designated for his people. How important is it then for you to hear the word of God from the Lord himself, assuring you that nothing will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. How important is it? Very important. But now you and I need to ask the question, why is it that Jesus could be so bold and so confident and so declarative, so emphatic about saving his people and them never perishing? It's going to be because of three, uh, three particular reasons 
which can be actually encapsulated under one term, and that is the shepherd. He has confidence in their salvation because he has confidence in who he is, which he has plainly declared in verse 11 and in verse 14. The title of our message today, and I want you to get this as we lay down the second to our last consideration of who he is as the shepherd of the people of God. He said in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. You got that? I am the good shepherd. And then he said it again in verse 14. I am the good shepherd. He said it twice. Now here's what I want you to get now because we're going to work this. You guys know adjectives are descriptions of nouns, right? The noun in our text is what? Shepherd. But the adjective is what? Good. Now I want you to get this now. He's describing himself in a certain way in order for us to understand that as the good shepherd, we have no reason to ever doubt that he will do what he said he would do. Now, when he said he is the good shepherd, the Jews understood fully well what he meant. They had already known about Yahweh the shepherd, right? I've taught you this before. The psalmist lays it out. The Old Testament lays it out. Israel was a shepherding people. God was the shepherd of his people in the Old Testament. He used men such as Moses and Joshua and others to lead his sheep out of Egypt into the promised land. Is that true? The days of Cain and Abel, Abel was a shepherd, Joseph was a shepherd, Jacob was a shepherd, Abraham and, and Isaac and the rest, they were all shepherds, herders of flocks. This is the great pedagogy of the Old Testament. We're all just sheep, right? And it all depends upon whose care we are under, whether or not we can find security and comfort. But the Old Testament makes it clear, according to Psalm 80, verse 1, that Yahweh is the shepherd of his people. Jehovah is the shepherd of his people. The Jews then hearing Christ call himself the shepherd would have known that he is there representing his father as the son of the living God, as the very God man, the very God man of very God himself, as the one who led Israel out of Egypt into the promises. They would have known that. But in order for him to press home the exclusivity of his office as shepherd, he calls himself the good shepherd. I just want you to get that. When he says, I am the good shepherd, what he was saying was, in light of being the good shepherd, there are no other good shepherds in the world. Y'all got that? Stay with me now. When he says, I am the good shepherd, that makes every other shepherd not good. All right? He, he's shutting down the shepherding business in Israel right here. And by virtue of him calling himself the good shepherd, he is excluding himself from them by virtue of his character, by virtue of his conduct, and by virtue of his care, which is the outline in your text that I want to develop today. You guys got that? When he says, I am the good shepherd, he's giving us insight into point one in your outline. He's giving us insight into who he is. Now, the term good in our text in verse 11 and 14 is a Greek term that corresponds to the idea of being intrinsically and qualitatively good, okay? Agathos is intrinsically and qualitatively good. The other word that is used is kelos, which also means good, but it describes a goodness that can be seen, a goodness that can be observed. When Christ talks about himself as good, he's talking about himself first as good intrinsically. You know a thing can look good on the outside, but be bad on the inside. Is that true? What Christ is saying here when he says, I am the good shepherd, he is saying, I am intrinsically good. I am internally good. I'm good through and through. Now, this is designed for you to understand how the sheep can find comfort in the shepherd. Because if the shepherd was not truly good, the shepherd might end up doing something like all the other shepherds did. One is, watch this now, run from the wolf when the wolf comes and leave the sheep to be slaughtered. You got that? See, we read in verse 13 of chapter 10 something of that nature. Notice what it says. The hireling fleeth because he is a what? Hireling and he does not what? 
care for the sheep. And immediately Jesus says in verse 14, but I am the good shepherd. Do you see it? If he were not the good shepherd, he might be inclined to leave some of us knuckleheads alone. Because some of us are bad enough to be left alone. There are some of us, the only person that can help us is Jesus. The only person that can deal with us is the Lord. And the reason why he can deal with us and no one else can is because of his intrinsic qualities. So stay with me. There are three adjectives that describe his role as shepherd. And I want to deal with them both over today and uh, next week in order for you to understand the larger role of his office as shepherd. John chapter 10 describes him as the good shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20, pull it up, describes him as the chief shepherd. I'm sorry, the great shepherd. John chapter 10 describes him as the good shepherd. John, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 describes him as the great shepherd. Look at it. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our who? Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. You see? That great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the everlasting covenant. Do you see it? I want you to understand, in order for him to be great, he must first be good. I'll deal with that next week. There's one more adjective I want you to look at with regards to the characteristics of your shepherd and mine, if you are a believer. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. 1 Peter 5, 4. I want you to see this now. Watch this, because I want to help you understand the beauty of the goodness of Christ in our text. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 5 verse 4, Peter is describing the time when the Lord Jesus will come back and straighten out all this mess that's going on. And notice how he describes Christ in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, do you see it? And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you, see the word ye? It's in the plural form, and guess who it's describing? Pastors and shepherds, no, pastors and shepherds such as I am. The epistle opens up in chapter 5, calling on the elders and the overseers and the leaders. Calling on the elders and the overseers and the leaders who are called shepherds. Peter was a shepherd. Paul was a shepherd. The disciples were shepherds. Pastors are called shepherds. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now I want you to get this now. If Christ was not a good shepherd, he could not be a great shepherd. And if he wasn't a great shepherd... He could not be a chief shepherd because as chief shepherd, he has preeminence over all the other under shepherds. Now, this is extremely important for your soul and mine. No chief shepherd, no under shepherd. No under shepherd, no gospel priest in faithfulness to you. Do you get that? No chief shepherd, no under shepherds because all under shepherds are are subordinate shepherds under the chief shepherd. Now, I'm going to drive that home more significantly next week. Your soul and my soul is dependent upon him not only being good, but being great. Not only being great, but being what? Chief. In order that the gospel might go into all the world by people called by God to preach that gospel and thus be shepherds for Christ to your soul. Go back to point number one. Let me work through this. I just stated to you that Jesus is calling himself the good shepherd in our text in order to help the disciples understand who he is qualitatively in his nature. And I want you to be blessed by this. Point number one, Christ was good in his what? Character. He was good in his character. Now, character means intrinsic qualities that manifest themselves in who you are as a distinct person. Your personhood and your character defines who you are, right? A person is who they are in terms of their character. Now, your character may very well manifest itself in ways different than your conduct. But if you are consistent with who you are in your character, you will be known in terms of your character by your what? Conduct. But character and conduct are two different things. You know what the word is? Hypocrisy. Y'all got that? So when we're talking character, what Jesus is saying when he says, I am the good shepherd, he's saying that I am the good shepherd because I am sinless in my being and in my person. Y'all got that? I am the good shepherd because I am sinless in my being and in my person. I am sinless in my being and in my person. 
It was just in John chapter 8, verse 46. Will you pull that up? John chapter 8, verse 46, where Jesus raised this question to the rulers. In John chapter 8, verse 46, he says, which of you convinces me of what? Now, if I'm telling you the truth, why do you not believe me? Christ over and over again challenged the rulers in their allegation that he was just a common human being, a common sinner like the rest of us. But how many of you know that Jesus never, ever once sinned? How many of you know that Jesus didn't know sin? How many of you know that in Jesus was no sin at all? I like to lay it out like this. The Bible says in him was no sin at all. That's 1 John chapter 3. The Bible says he knew no sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 and 21. What that means is he was never acquainted with it. You couldn't charge him with hanging out with sin. You and I drink sin like, like water. The Lord Jesus has nothing to do with sin. The Bible plainly tells us that he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Are y'all with me? Right. And so the Bible says he also did no sin. This is 1 Peter chapter 2. And the reason why I lay this out is because if Jesus actually knew sin, did sin, sin was in him, he could not be good. Got it? He could not be good. We learned this last night in our men's meeting. When the Bible talks about good, and men love to take terms and, and define them in ways that correspond to themselves, but when the Bible talks about good, ultimately good can only be ascribed to one person. Do you know who that is? God himself. You know how us religious folks go, God is good. Right? And then somebody, Antiphony says what? All the time. Right? We do that, right? But the theology is really good. Remember what the rich young ruler did in Matthew chapter uh, 19, verse 18, pull that up. Came to the master and said, good master, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Remember that? And then what did the master say? Why are you calling me good? Verse 17, I'm sorry. Verse 17, why are you calling me good? And do you re recall how our Lord remarked? Look at it. He said unto him, why are you calling me good? There is none good but what? There is none good but one, and that is who? So you see that Christ himself is defining goodness in terms of the character and qualitative nature of the being of God. You see it? And I've said this before. When the Bible plainly says that all we, like sheep, have gone astray, every one of us has turned to our own way, the whole of humanity, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, are not good. We are not good. Do you hear what I just said? Intrinsically, we are not good. The moment that there is sin in us, we are no longer good. And so you and I are not intrinsically good. We are not qualitatively good. And our conduct tells on us, don't it? You know how when you would to do good, evil is present with you? And the evil that you would not do, you find yourself doing? Do you know what that's about? You and I are not intrinsically good. Now, you and I can be good by derivation. And that is to say, when God makes you born again, when he quickens you by his spirit, you become a new creature in Christ. Now you're good. You guys understand that? It's a new nature in you that allows you to love God and want God and serve God. And God's working in your life. So there's a, a, a core principle of goodness in your life when you're born again. Does that make sense? But along with that goodness is still the badness. Y'all got that, right? We call it the civil war, right? The struggle within. That's, you know, the, the schizophrenic sheep, that's what we are, right? That's who we are by nature, right? So if you're actually saved, you are by derivation good, but you are not ontologically or originally good. We must own that whatever goodness is in us is from God. Can I get a witness? Right, this is important because the point that I'm getting ready to make has to do with the security of your soul. C, because if ontologically and in the totality of your being you are good, you can contend with Christ for your goodness. And then you and him would be battling for the glory when you get to heaven. But from what I understand, when we get to heaven, you know what we're going to be saying? Not unto us, not unto us, O oh Lord, but unto your name be all the glory. Do you know why? Because we will have been convinced as believers down here that we are never, ever, ever in and of ourselves good. Got it? Got it? In order that the exclusivity of the goodness might remain with our shepherd. If the sheep make it to glory with them stupid selves, 
Will they turn around and tell somebody, you know, I was smart, man, I made it. You got that? Goodness on the part of the shepherd is what I'm driving home for the next 30 minutes in your life. I want you to get it. I want you to understand that when we look at point number one, there are several things about the goodness of Christ that we must know. That he is sinless in his being and in his deeds. I call this the true Jew. The one who is without guile. Christ alluded to this in John's Gospel, chapter 1. If you back up over to John's Gospel, chapter 1, about verse 45, when he was dealing with Nathaniel and Philip. And I just want you to see this before we transition to our second point. Here's what he said in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 42, and then uh, following. In fact, it's verse 47. I'm going to start at verse 45. Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, watch this now, can there any good thing come up out of Nazareth? They had a reputation in Nazareth for being really, really bad, notorious criminal types like those of us who, rolled, who, 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 who were raised up in West Oakland. So Nazareth is like West Oakland. Nazareth is like, like Richmond. We already talked about that. We didn't talk about this for years, right? Nazareth is like, like Hunter's Point, right? That's how Nazareth is. That's Hunter's Point. But that's where Christ grew up. And what our brother is saying, can any good thing come out of a bad place like that? And the answer is yes. But it's only one. It's only one. But I want you to hear what Jesus says, our master says, about Nathaniel. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite, what? Indeed, in whom is no what? Do you understand what he just said about Nathanael? He made Nathanael equal to himself. Why do I say that? Because to be without guile is to be without sin. This is the one qualification which made Jesus to be the lawful substitute for your soul. The book of Isaiah chapter 53, let me show it to you, underscores this. It's Isaiah chapter 53 that underscores the idea of Christ's sinlessness. Isaiah 53 verse 9, in fact, is the text that I want you to see. And I want you to see what it says about this one who becomes for you and I a substitute. And why the Father chose him to be the one who would suffer such judgment on your behalf. Isaiah 53 verse 9. 8 and 9, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He made his grave with the wicked. Is this talking about Jesus? Were there two thieves on each side of the Lord Jesus Christ? He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Did not Joseph of Arimathea buy his tomb? The rich man. Now notice what it says. Because he had done no what? Neither was there any what? Deceit in his mouth. The word is guile. He had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. This is a term that describes the true Jew, and I don't want to expand on it too far, but the ideal of the true Jew is the man who comes from God, who has kept all of God's law, all of God's word, and therefore is joined to God by a goodness that only God can be described as. And in the Bible, the only true Jew that we really know is Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, that attribute is given to every believer in Christ when you and I are born again. There's a real sense in which all of us who are true believers are without guile before God. Look at Revelation chapter 14. I want you to see it. Revelation 14. Revelation 14 is describing the believer who overcomes and is given a mark on his forehead and the mark on their forehead is their father's name. These are the people that the father owns as eternal slaves. Verse 1, And I looked and lo, a lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus. He stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his whose name? Father's name written in their what? These people are said to be, in verse 4, those which were not defiled with women. For they are what? These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Is this describing the believer? Is this describing the saints of God? Are we the first fruits unto Christ? 
Are we the sheep that follow him wherever he goes? Do we have the father's name written in our forehead? That is the Old Testament symbolism of a stamp planted on the forehead. Watch this now. When you were owned as a slave. Now, every one of God's people are slaves of Christ. We are slaves of God through Christ. We are slaves of God through Christ. And we have a mark, a stigma placed on our forehead. Not a physical one that can be seen. But it's the Father's name, it's the Father's glory, it's the identity of the Father in our mind because we have been begotten of God by the death of Christ and by the power of the Spirit of God. This is how we can cry, Abba, Father. Am I making some sense? This is how we can cry, Abba, Father, because we are sons and daughters of God. We are owned by God. We are owned by God. And the language says we are virgins. Is the church depicted as a virgin? The language says we are the first fruits of God. Are we the first fruits of God? Yes, we are because the last fruit will be the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth. But look at the next verse. This is talking about you, although I know you can't believe it. This is talking about you. Look at this. And in their mouth was found what? For they are without fault before the throne of God. What miraculous work did God do to clean up Isaiah's mouth and then clean my mouth up? Because Lord knows I had a raggedy mouth back in the day. You bumped me and you got a whole bunch of that. Y'all remember that? And out of the abundance of the heart doth the mouth what? And when a man or woman is born again and he changes your heart, shouldn't your conversation change? Shouldn't you learn how to speak the language of Canaan? Shouldn't you be able to declare the gospel? Shouldn't the word of God, the pure word of God, be the thing now that governs your conversation? We get to see then our perfection in Christ when we understand who he is and who we are in him. And I'm looking forward to the day when I'm truly and totally without guile, aren't you? Don't want to cuss no more. Don't want to cuss no more. Don't want to think bad no more. A few of y'all understand what I'm saying. The rest of you stuck. I got it. Christ was good in his character. Because he was sinless in his being and in his person. Sinless in his being and in his person. But Christ was also good in his conduct. He was good in his conduct. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 29. This could also be ascribed to John 8, 46, where he says, which of you convinces me of sin, right? Because with sin, it's the motive as well as the conduct, right? God doesn't only judge us on what we do. He judges us on why we did it, right? Remember, he helped Cain understand, boy, you in trouble, and I can see it on your face. I'm letting you know sin is at the door, and if you don't master it, it's going to master you. So God saw the sin before it was acted out in the life of Cain, right? So you and I know that sin is not merely what we do, it's who we are. But here's what Christ said again. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that what? Mm. Our master was good in his conduct. He was good in his conduct. Now see, you and I can't say that. I'm so glad I'm saved by grace, aren't you? And I'm glad the Father's with me, but he's only with me because he's with him. And I'm only with the Father because I'm with him too. And he's with me, right? And the grounds, therefore, of my confidence lie in not my conduct, but his conduct. So you see our security lies in his, char his, uh, his character, and our security lies in his what? His conduct. Isn't that beautiful? We've got someone representing us, if we're true believers, who can say, I never once sinned. I always please the Father. See, this is what gives me joy. I got a representative with whom the Father is always happy. You got it? always happy. Now what I'm laying out for you guys today is the goodness of the shepherd. You got it? So the first one is clear. He was good in his character. Secondly, he was good in his conduct. John 8, 29. Look at verse 32. John 8, 32 as well. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Make you free. Now, I uh, let me see here. Start uh, back at verse 31. Watch this now. Then Jesus said to those Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall what? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? 
Right. So when you learn the truth about the character of Christ and you learn the truth about the conduct of Christ, doesn't it liberate your soul? Doesn't it liberate your soul? When you learn the truth that your shepherd is faithful and is always faithful and he is always pleasing to the Father, doesn't it liberate you from you? See, this is what we call gospel liberty. Now, gospel liberty is freedom from myself because of him who represents me. This is why your heart has to be constantly turned to Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the eyes of your faith, in order that you might be delivered from yourself because yourself will let you down. Ask David. We've been going through the psalmist now over the Wednesday uh, Psalms class, and David will tell you, boy, you can be down in the dumps, can't you? You can be just messed up when you're stuck on yourself. And this is why it's important for you to know that you are the sheep and he's the shepherd. I'm getting ready to go to my third point, but I do want to drive this home. Sometimes we can act like we are the shepherd. You got that? Sometimes we can act like we know where we're going and we know how to get there. And that all y'all need to do is follow me. Now, when I say y'all, I'm talking about anybody in your family, your husband, your boyfriend, everybody that even pays you two cents. We can act like we are the shepherd and we know where we're going. Just follow, just follow. Come on, follow me. Right? And nothing could be further from the truth. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know if you're going to make it out this building to your car or home tonight. There is no reason for anybody to follow you or me anytime because you don't control the heavens or the earth or the sea or the things that are in them right so it's important for you and I to know that when Christ was speaking about him being the good shepherd he is laying out for his disciples his character his conduct his conduct his conduct his conduct was flawless and he was sincere in his obedience and I love it first Peter chapter 2 verse 22 look at it this is a beautiful statement I quoted it earlier, but I want to drive it home as part of the preliminaries for you to find comfort in the fact that he is the good shepherd. What does Peter say? He says that Jesus did no sin. See it? Neither was guile found in his mouth. This is in the Aries tense. And what that means is when we go back and look at the whole of Jesus' life and follow it all the way through, not one time. Isn't that amazing? Not one time. Did he ever sin? Even as the little boy Jesus, growing up with his knucklehead brothers and sisters, living with a mother and a father that was flawed, he never thought an evil thought about mama or daddy. Now see, that's what we jacked up already. Aren't we jacked up? The kids in the house is jacked up already. Don't turn and look at your mom and daddy. Don't turn. Don't look. Now, you know this the way you think. You know that. Right? First, you think they're crazy, and then you think they're evil. Right? You only come to think that they're better when you get older and realize you just as crazy and just as evil. The fruit don't fall far from the tree. The fruit don't fall far from the tree. Right? It just don't fall far. Yeah? <laughs> right? But Christ never wants had an evil thought, glorious in his person. This is why we exalt him, because of the splendor of the hypostatic union, the mystery of the God-man, the mystery of the deity in flesh, the mystery of the co-union of humanity and divinity, the mystery of the obedience of the only sinless man, the mystery of it. From the womb to the tomb, he never sinned, nor was God found. That means when, you were, when the uh, brothers were hanging out with Jesus at the club, because you know he did go to the club from time to time. Don't stumble at this. He hung out with, they didn't have the kind of clubs we do today, but they had clubs, obviously. Because the Pharisees were always saying he eats and drinks with sinners and publicans and, you know, he's hanging out with bad folks, right? So it had to be places that were specious and, and questionable, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you and I go to the club, we're going to get jacked up. 
right? I mean, the devil going to haul ties, drag us in, and we ain't going to have a dime of a witness for Jesus. I'm letting you know that now. So, so you don't have the power to make it. I'm going to go witness in the club. No, you're not. You're going to go get drunk in the club. Follow this now. Right, man, you know that I was looking for an opportunity witness, Lord. Nothing came up. Right, so, so stay right here. Right here, right. Because the Holy Ghost didn't go in the club with you. When you went in, Holy Ghost stayed outside. He was the butler outside in the car. I'll wait till he come out. He going to need somebody to drive. Right? But our Lord could go in there. Because he didn't have the problem you and I have. I need to get to that. Because it's in our text. Point number three, not only was Christ good in his character, Christ was good in his conduct. Christ was good in his care. Look at John chapter 10, verse 11, and then verse 14. And I want to show you something splendid. I'm going to park it here a little bit just so that this can be driven home. I want you to see this. Lord, help your sheep to see this. This is important to see. In John chapter 10, verse 11, when he says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We're talking about care now. Okay? We're talking about care now. Now watch what he says in verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. We're talking about care now. You got that? Care. This is what makes him qualified to be the good shepherd. Not only does he lay down his life, didn't we learn it last week? Not only did he enter into the door to reveal to us who he was so that he called us out of the fold of fallen humanity, he became the door for us of the sheepfold by which he protects us from the wolves that would otherwise come in to destroy us. He lays out his life to protect his sheep. He becomes the door that protects us on the inside. He becomes the door that lets us out. He could only do that by laying down his life. Are y'all with me? Only by him caring enough to become the door could you and I go in and out and find pasture. That is a powerful concept that I'm going to drive home significantly next week because I do want you to understand why he is saying, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. It's because... He was good in his care for his sheep. I want you to mark the word care in your outline. Christ was good in his care. Verse 14 says, I know I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am what? Known of mine. What does that imply? What does that infer? What is that developing? What is that drawing out for us? In my outline, I have a total care of the what? Is that what you have? A total care of the sheep. I call this a total care package. Or you can describe this as a total care system. It's a total care system. How total is this care? It's so total that it, encom it encompasses eternity past, the present, and eternity future. This is how total the care package is. He cared about us, past tense before the world began. When in the covenant promises that was made between him and the Father, he said yes to the Father to have a people for himself. He cared for us before the world began, so much so that he voluntarily became the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. Is that care? Before God created anything, Jesus says, I care. Before he made the first man, Christ said, I care. Is that care? Before we got here, he had already cared for us by assuming the role of coming. That's the second care that in the past since I know he cared for me. He cared for me enough not only to say yes to the covenant promise, but he cared for me enough to come into the world. He was born of a woman made under the law, right? In order that he might bear the curse of the law for those of us who were under the judgment of the law. Did he care? Did he care enough to take on our nature? Did he care enough to live a perfect life? Did he care enough to come and go to Calvary? 
So he cared from eternity to enter into a covenant promise. He cared in time to assume a human nature, go to Calvary, right, and redeem our hell-bound soul. Does he care? And then he also cares in the present tense right now. He cares. Does he care for you? He cares. So let me, let, me, let me expand on this for a moment. Because when you and I think about care, there are two cares that I want you to uh, consider in the scripture. The care of man and the care of God. The care of man. So Peter, the under shepherd in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 puts it this way. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, I want us to look at that because I'm going to show you the play on the terms. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may do what? When? Alright, see the part that you and I don't like is that last line. We want to be exalted but we don't want to wait on God for our exaltation. Pull that verse up and meditate on it this week. Because we'll call on God but we're not humble enough to wait on God. Because he said he's going to exalt you. Now we believe that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he's going to make it good. If he declared it, he's going to bring it to pass. Is that what the word says? Right. But the problem you and I have with God is when? Then all of a sudden we want to throw the whole of the promises out the window because God's win is not our win. Is that true? Now God says he's going to exalt you in due time. Now I know one time he's going to exalt you. When he comes back, there's an exalt, exaltation for all of God's people when he comes back. Is that true? But pastor, I don't want to wait that long. But take that up with him. Because he may leave you in a humble lifestyle all your days. Because he knows your makeup, your tendencies, your bent, your proclivities, your inclinations, your proclivities, and all of the other ease that you have. He knows your ease. And your S's, right? He knows all of your old CDs and he knows all that about you, right? And he knows how to get you to glory, right? He might just take you through the valley most of your journey. Lord, I want to go to the mountaintop. No, the mountaintop won't work for you. Not for, not for you. No, you get in trouble on the mountaintop. On the mountaintop, you start seeing visions and having dreams and revelations and you take your eyes off me. The valley, that keeps you praying. That valley, that keeps you coming to Bible study. The valley, that keeps you studying your word. The valley, that keeps you trusting in the promises of God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me in the valley. You understand? Some of us can't get home except through the valley. But I want to press home the word care, and it's given to us in verse 7. Watch this. Verse 7 is what I want to work through right now. Casting all your what? Fear. On him for he what? Fear. Right. So it's very important for you to understand that your cares is not his cares. Your cares are not his cares. Please get this. Your cares are the consequence of you becoming confused. Your cares are the com consequence of you becoming complex. Your cares are the consequence of you becoming complicated. Did that word help? I gave you three words. We're working on the word C today, right? Care, right? So, so watch this now. You, sometimes you do get confused. Is that true? And, and so sometimes you do get a little bit complicated. Is that true? And sometimes you get a little bit complex, right? Now, that's because that Greek term there, neuromo, is a Greek term that means to become divided. To become divided. The word means that you lose that sense of soundness and unity and integralness, and now you become schizophrenic. It's the word that corresponds to James chapter 1 when James told the brother, listen, do not expect the double-minded man to receive anything from the Lord. Now, when you and I are driven by the care of the first part of the verse, you and I are operating in a manner by which we are split in our thinking. We are divided in our thoughts. 
We are now tossed to and fro. We are unsound. We are not grounded. We are not rooted. And this is where the word anxiety comes in. You guys got that? That's the same word that our master talked about in Matthew 6 when he says, do not be careful for anything. These issues that go on in this world, the cares of this life, that's a consequence of this world being divided. This world being complicated. Now, complex is cute, but the problem is complex simply means that you are not rooted in God. I'm complex. Yeah, you're complex because you're divided in 50 different directions. You're complex because your reasoning and your focus is not committed on God and his truth. Now, now come on with me, saints. Do you know how when things come into our lives and they become just so overwhelming that we don't know which way to go? Can I get a witness? I, I feel like I'm in the house by myself. So when you, are, when you are at that place where you don't know which way to go, and you, you don't know which way to go so bad, watch this, you don't even go to God. See, now I'm, I'm touching on some shit. I'm going to show you something right here. Sometimes you get so caught up in your complicated self. Have to. Have to. Because we play church with ourselves. We'll tell ourselves we're all right with God. And you're so complicated, you don't even know how to go to the throne of God and say, God, I'm too complex today. I'm not myself today. I'm thinking thoughts to the left, thoughts to the right, thoughts up, thoughts down. I'm thinking carnal thoughts, secular thoughts, crazy thoughts. I'm not landing on the truth, oh God. See, this is called anxiety. This is called the fears. This is called the double-mindedness that occurs. Watch this now. That occurs when you take your mind off God and allows it to be caught up in the cares of this life. Do you guys get that? So your care is what? Not God's care. This is amazing. Now watch what Peter says. Peter says you need to take all of that stuff and treat it like, watch this now, like leprosy. Like you're wearing a leprous garment. What you need to hurry up and do is throw that thing off and cast it over on the Lord Jesus. You need to take your cares and your anxieties and your double-mindedness and your duplicity and your complicatedness and your complexity and say, Lord, please handle this. Please handle this. But see, in order for you to do that, you have to believe God. You won't do it if you don't believe God. You know what you'll do? You'll struggle with working out your complexities yourself. And you'll dig a bigger hole. And the reason you're doing it is because you're lost to the fact that your problem starts with you, not the problem. Am I making some sense? Am I drawing? Am I making some sense? Would you? So now watch this. Christ has even accommodated an answer for that. And the first answer is for the believer is to be able to take all of that burden and lay it at the feet of Christ. The verb there to cast really means to throw it as if abhorring it and rejecting it because you know it's going to harm you. But listen, you can't throw it anywhere successfully but to God. Because if you throw it anywhere else, it's coming back. Return to cinder. That's how it's coming. If you don't throw it to God, it's coming back. God has a place for that kind of care. He has a, a, he has a, a, a junkyard, a dump place for that kind of care. And it's called the cross of Jesus Christ. It's called the cross of Christ. It's the place where you're going to find peace from your insanity. Now, when he says, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And I said, his care is not your care. And your care is not his care. God has no anxieties. God is not double-minded. God is not complex within himself. God is not complicated. God is not twisted. God doesn't say yes and no. God is simple. God is pure. God is clear. God is integral. He walks in a constant state of unity within himself. He never forsakes himself. He never starts off to do something and then decides not to do it in unfaithfulness to himself. Are y'all with me? Right. In the realm and dimension of God, there are no storms. 
God is always in control. You and I are hardly ever in control. God's always in control. God's always in charge. God controls the microorganisms. The subatomic particles are governed by God. Not a molecule in the universe operates outside of the immediate supervision and control of a sovereign God. Watch this. Even the chaos makes sense to God. The darkness and the light are the same to God. There is nothing in God that is complex. Is there anything too hard for me, Jeremiah? You guys got that? There's nothing. Didn't I make everything? Doesn't he that give knowledge know? God's infinite, sovereign, stable, rooted, immutable, unchangeable. And so is your shepherd. So is your shepherd. So what the sheep are supposed to do is take their crazy and cast it on his stability. Now watch this. Because he cares. Let me see if I can lay this out. Let me see if I can lay this out. Literally, literally, the way this is to be understood is that we are to cast our care upon him. Watch this now. Because with him, you are his care. We are to cast our cares upon him because with him, you are his care. I want to develop that, but I wanted to come home. Did you get it? The believer is Christ's care. Now, this is literally the term that can be translated this way. You are the focal point of his interest. You are the object of his primary concern. I could interpret it in keeping with the analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. You are his total object of interest and concern. The shepherd is not interested in anything but the sheep. The whole goal of his existence and his office is to watch over, observe, guard and protect, nurture and develop, strengthen and guide his sheep to its destination. His whole purpose for existence is to care for the sheep. A total care package. From glory in time to glory. From glory in time to glory. It's Mark's gospel as well as Matthew. Where the disciples are on the boat. Jesus intentionally saying we're going to go from one side of the ministry to another side. Let's jump on the boat. Storm rises up. Jesus in the back sleep. He was trying to teach them something. Because remember, we had already identified him with John in John's Gospel, chapter 129, as the Lamb of God. Well, that means that he had to have a shepherd too. His shepherd was his daddy. Come on now. This is the father-son paradigm. Am I making some sense? The son was constantly kept by his father. Is that true? And the immediacy of the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is the third person that was given to him at his baptism, was to assure a sensibility of his father's approval and care in his humanity, which is the reason why he gives us the third person too. The immediacy, we call him the landlord. The Holy Ghost is the landlord. You guys understand that? And his job is to give you a sensibility of the father's care for you. Since the father is in glory and the son is in glory, the third person is the resident Lord. His job is to help you get it. That God in Christ cares for you. How many of you guys with me so far? I got a few more minutes to get this. A few more minutes to press this home. Right. So this is why you got to stop acting like the shepherd. Because you don't have the total care package. If you do show it to me, will you show me the total care package? Can you tell me whether or not you were there in eternity past? To fix my eternal destiny? Can you even help me understand what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked from that, that, that courtroom to Golgotha? 
Can you tell me what happened when they closed the curtains and their eclipse took place on that day from 9 in the morning to 12 noon? Rather, from 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the evening. Can you tell me what took place? Can you tell me what took place when Christ on that cross says, it is finished? Can you really tell me what took place? Can you tell me what took place when he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You can't. Because this total care package was between the Father and the Son for you and me. You guys understand that? There's some things that the sheep just don't need to know. All they need to know is who they know, not what they know. Am I making some sense? We know on that day, the sun went dark for three hours. And when the sun came back out, everything was good. See, and my point is, the total care that Christ has for his sheep is designed for his sheep to rest in the fact that we are nothing but sheep. And the job of the sheep, let's get back to the boring stuff again, is to follow, feed, and fold. Follow, feed, and fold. What you doing all your life? I'm following Jesus. What else you doing? I'm feeding on Jesus. What else you doing? I'm folding in Jesus. Well, what you going to do next? Follow Jesus. Well, what else you going to do? Feed on Jesus. Well, what you going to do after that? I'm going to fold in Jesus. I'm going to ask you one more time. Well, what else you? I just told you what I'm going to do. And when I lay in that casket and they preach my funeral, that's going to be my last fold. I'm folding it up and I'm getting out of here. I'm folding it up and I'm getting out of here. You got it? Listen to this language then. Under the care of Christ for his sheep. He cares for us in four ways. Like I said, he cared about us in eternity. He cared about us in time. He cared about us at the cross. He cared about us in our conversion. He cared enough to get us when we were lost. Is that true? Yeah. You guys remember that day he showed up as a shepherd of your life? When you were living in sin and in darkness and rebellion against God and he tapped you on the shoulder. He said, you coming with me? You said no. He said yes. And he won. Remember that? Do you remember that? You said no. He said yes. And he won. Right? Because he lets you go further in the darkness and you realize this is too dark. And then he opens your eyes to his glory and he began to draw you to himself and you found yourself saying yes to Jesus. He came and got you. You didn't come get him. He called you. You didn't call him. He quickened you by his spirit. You didn't quicken him. And all of a sudden the gospel was glorious to your soul. You found yourself in your heart saying yes to Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. And all of a sudden, you've been, you're following him, walking in the light. And didn't we learn it? Proverbs chapter 4, 18, the path of the just is a shining light that shines more and more and more. And that's what's happening in our life, right? We are becoming more clearer, not more knowledgeable, more clearer on that which he has already told us. Not more knowledgeable, clearer on the knowledge of the truth of who he is and what he did. That's where there's comfort in your soul. Not the mere amassing of all sorts of knowledge, but the truth which is in Christ, which stabilizes the soul and roots us and grounds us in him and prepares us for the day when he calls us home. This is what we're dealing with. He was good in his character, good in his conduct. He was good in his care of his sheep. Fourthly and finally, let's deal with it. Do you have a fourth point in your outline? Christ was good in his communion with his what? Good in his communion with his father. I'm going to just uh, comment on this briefly, shut it down, and here's where we're going to pick it up next week. I love this part, but it does require some preparation on our part to think it through. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 30. In John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 30, and then I want us to look at verse 36 through 38. John 10, 30, are we there? Let me start back at verse... Uh, at verse, uh, uh, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. This is where we're going to begin our contemplation next week. Because this is massive for your security. All right? But this is just, this is too complex of an imagery to rush through. I want us to work this through. Can we work this through? Because see, this is a father-son enterprise in behalf of those they care about. Y'all get that? This is a father-son enterprise in behalf of those who are the interest of their concern. 
This is a father-son enterprise. And for whatever reason, the Lord vocalized it in order for us to hear it for our comfort. Remember what I said in the opening of our message? The security of the believer lies not in what we do, but what he did. And the assurance of the believer lies not in what we do, but what he said. Because security doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. It has to do with facts. Assurance has to do with your feelings. When you are assured, it's because someone gives you promises that you can rest in. Am I making sense? Right. Security. Listen, you can be unassured and be just as secure as I don't know what. Does that make sense? But you can't be secure without also ultimately coming to discover your assurance. Meaning this, God can secure you in Christ and you don't even know it. Because security has to do with something taking place on the outside of you. The assurance that the believer struggles with is the assurance of the believer coming to discover that security. This is why theology is important. If your salvation is built on what you did, watch this, no security and your assurance is a delusion. If your salvation is built on what he did, watch this, you have the security of your salvation because God is not a man that he should lie. Even though you may not have the assurance in your soul because you're weak in faith and don't study your Bible. Now listen to these words as we close. Christ was good in his communion with his father. John chapter 10 verse 30 says this. I and my father understand that Jesus is speaking more particularly to his disciples even though the Jews were interested in his narrative because they wanted to find a way to destroy him. He closes out the doctrine of eternal security, the security of his people, on the grounds of the collaborative work that existed between him and his father. The father is greater than I. No one can pluck them out of my hand, and no one will pluck them out of his hand because I and my father are one. And they are one in three ways. Their unity of purpose. Do you see? They always agreed. There was nothing that the father did that the son didn't agree with. And there was nothing that the son did that the father didn't agree with. They walked in consistent and unending and immutable unity. You guys got that? Agreement is a very important thing in legal terms. You guys got that? They're also, it is also important in relational terms. There is no time where the son did something that the father didn't agree with. Nor is there a time that the father determined or purposed or willed something that the son didn't agree with. They were one in their purpose. But they were also one or unified in their what? Practice. John chapter 5 verse 17 through 19, Jesus says, my father is working, and I am also working. You guys got that? In other words, what Christ was saying is, I'm not working by myself. My father is working. And in fact, watch this. The work that I am doing, it's father. The father that's doing the work through me. In fact, it's the father and son doing the work. So they never willed anything contrary to either each other. They never worked anything contrary to each other. They were always one. Am I making some sense? How can two walk together except they be what? Their practice was one. And finally, their unity of what? Promise. That's right. Their unity of promise. Your Bible from Genesis to Revelation promises eternal life. It promises a God who is mighty to save. It promises to redeem sinners from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Doesn't it? And wherever you read in your Bible the promises of God, you are reading of the promises of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And what you see in Scripture is how they work those promises out. Is that true? How they work them out. This is what Jesus meant when he says, I and my Father are one. For the sheep, this ought, this ought to allow you to feed in the green pastures of his grace and his mercy and goodness and get so fat that you roll over on your back with your legs 
flopping in the air. You with me? You roll over on your back with your legs flapping in the air and say, you know what, whenever the Lord wants to come get me, he can come get me, turn me back over on my feet. But I'm going to just stay right here because he leads me into green pastures where I can feed in confidence and in security, fearing nothing, fearing nothing, fearing nothing. Amen.